In my last video, I introduced the argument from precedent. That is the argument that not only the mythological accretions of Jesus Christ, but also the historical figure arose not from the historical record of a real person, but rather from euhemerization of a prior mythical Jesus character. And that character in turn was the Jewish version of an ancient fashion in God-making, the dying and rising saviour God. And so the argument goes, we can find many examples of these dying and rising saviours amongst ancient gods. The dying and rising god idea has been debated in scholarship over the past century, since it was introduced by J.G. Fraser in 1906. It's been in and out of favour since then and appears at the moment to be largely out of favour, though a recent serious defence of it was put by Mettinger in his 2001 monograph The Riddle of Resurrection. The debate has focused on two issues. The primary one of these is whether there is a group of interdependent dying and rising gods, that is, the dying and rising theme was not invented independently several times, but rather was a fashion in god-making that was copied from one god to another. Related to this is the debate about just how similar these dying and rising gods were to each other and to Jesus. Naturally, dying and rising proponents argue that the similarities are strong, whereas their opponents argue that they are weak. I plan to look at several gods in this category, and I'll start in this video with Adonis. Adonis was the Greek god of beauty and sexual desire. He was a beautiful youth and associated with fertility. Most of what we know about Adonis comes from Greek and Latin texts dated from the 2nd century AD and later. At that time, Adonis was seen as a Greek hero figure. That is, someone who may have been a real person or mythical, but died and was mourned, rather than being immortal like a true god. The figure of Adonis probably originated a thousand or more years earlier in the Levant region, and he is associated with several locations in the Near East, including Lebanon, Antioch, Laodicea, Byblos and Bethlehem. He was first worshipped in Phoenicia by the Canaanites, so close to Judea, and was later adopted by the Greeks. We have much more evidence about the later Greek Adonis than we do about his Levantine precursor. The evidence we have about Adonis can be divided into two groups. One of these describes the religious rites that were offered to him, and the other describes his mythical biography. Taking first the myth of Adonis, as always, there are several versions. I'll give the one that's mainly taken from Ovid's Metamorphosis, which appeared in 8 AD, so it could easily have been available to the founders of Christianity. Smyrna, the daughter of the Assyrian king Theus, had intercourse with her father through trickery and conceived Adonis. Theus found out and decided to kill her. Smyrna pleaded with the gods to help her escape her father's wrath. An unidentified goddess changed her into a myrrh tree. This enabled her to escape death at her father's hands and also avoid punishment for her deed in the underworld. Then later Adonis was somehow born from the tree. He was then alone and helpless in the forest. The goddess Aphrodite happened to be passing. At some point around this time, Aphrodite had been accidentally stabbed by one of the arrows of her son Cupid and consequently fell in love with Adonis. Aphrodite then entrusted Adonis's care to the thonic goddess Persephone, Queen of the Dead, who took him to the underworld. But she too fell in love with him and refused to give him back to Aphrodite. The argument got so heated that Zeus intervened and settled the matter with a compromise. Zeus required that Adonis spend one third of each year with each goddess, and the remaining third with whomever he chose. He chose to spend two thirds of the year with Aphrodite. So Adonis spent part of the year, spring and summer, on earth with Aphrodite, and the rest of the year in the underworld with Persephone. While on earth with Aphrodite, he would go hunting, one time, when Aphrodite was away, he went out hunting and found a wild boar. Aphrodite had warned him to avoid wild boars. Adonis threw his spear at the boar and wounded it, but the wound wasn't serious. The enraged boar charged Adonis and gored him in the thigh. Adonis lay bleeding and wailing and was heard by Aphrodite who appeared on the scene, and Adonis died in her arms. She sprinkled his blood with nectar, or her tears, and anemone flowers sprang up. This is a red flower that readily sheds its petals in a light wind. And so the blood of Adonis turned the river Adonis red each spring. There are many versions of the origin of the wild boar. It may have been sent to kill him by Artemis, 
out of envy for his hunting skills, or to take revenge on Aphrodite for the death of Hippolytus, or by Ares, who is jealous of Aphrodite's love for him, or it was Ares in the form of a boar, or the boar was sent by Apollo to punish Aphrodite for blinding his son Erymanthus, or by whoever for whatever reason. Ovid's record of this myth is fairly late, but the elements appear to be depicted on a mirror found at the ancient town of Pranes, close to Rome, dating from the 5th to 3rd centuries BC. Turning from myth to the evidence from rites, the festival of Adonis was an annual celebration occurring in late July. There is some evidence that there may have been two festivals, with another one occurring in the spring. Sappho, writing around 600 BC, refers to women bemoaning the dead Adonis by beating their breasts and rending their tunics. Aristophanes' Lysistrata from 411 BC records rites taking place on the roofs of buildings where women sing, dance and beat their breasts for Adonis. Ovid, who was born in 43 BC, refers to an annual celebration to commemorate Adonis' death and we sometimes find Adonis referred to as a bad omen, such as by Plutarch, who was born in 45 BC. When referring to the departure of the Athenian fleet in 415 BC, then much later, Anmianus Marcellinus, who was born around 330 AD, recounts how when Emperor Julian visited Antioch in 362 AD, his visit coincided with the celebration of Adonis, which symbolised the reaping of ripe fruit from the field, and involved melancholy wailing and cries of grief. Then, as well as the celebrations, we learn of Adonis gardens, which were symbols of the ephemeral nature of vegetation and sterility, though in fairness some scholars have argued that they were symbols of death and rebirth. These were small plantations of short-lived herbs in pottery vessels. Plato refers to them, having Socrates say, Would a sensible husbandman, who has seeds which he cares for and which he wishes to bear fruit, plant them with serious purpose in the heat of summer in some garden of Adonis, and delight in seeing them appear in beauty in seven days? Or would he do that sort of thing, when he did it at all, only in play and for amusement? Would he not, when he was in earnest, follow the rules of husbandry, plant his seeds in fitting ground, and be pleased when those which he had sowed reached their perfection in the seventh month? Further afield, Theocritus and Cyril of Alexandria recount details of Adonis celebrations from Egypt. Theocritus was a Greek writer from Syracuse who described an Adonis feast in Egypt under the Ptolemies during the early 3rd century BC. The rites were a two-day affair. On the first day, Adonis gardens were in evidence, and the union of Adonis and Aphrodite was celebrated. The second day was a lament for the death of Adonis. The lament involved a song that celebrated his coming that year and referred to his hoped-for arrival the next year. Much later, Cyril of Alexandria, who died in 444 AD, recounts a myth of Adonis recording that the Greeks united in weeping and lamentation with Aphrodite when she was in mourning for Adonis. And then she reappeared from the underworld and announced that she had found the one she had been looking for, which was accompanied by joyful celebrations. Origen was born in Alexandria around 180 AD, and from 231 on he lived in Caesarea. He recounts that the god who the Greeks called Adonis is called Tammuz amongst the Jews and Syrians. Worshippers perform some sort of initiation rites every year involving mourning as if he were dead, and then rejoicing on his behalf as if he has risen from the dead. Those who are knowledgeable about the deeper interpretation of the Greek myths and what is called mythic theology say that Adonis is the symbol of the fruits of the earth, which are mourned when they are sown, but which rise, thereby causing joy amongst the farmers when they grow up. Incidentally, Tammuz also appears in Ezekiel 8 verse 14. Lucians, or pseudo-Lucians, today Syria, is probably from the 2nd century AD. It recounts, I did see, however, in Byblos, a great sanctuary of Aphrodite of Byblos, in which they perform the rites of Adonis, and I learned about the rites. They say, at any rate, that what the boar did to Adonis occurred in their territory. As a memorial to his suffering each year, they beat their breasts, mourn and celebrate the rites. Throughout the land they perform solemn lamentations. When they cease their breast beating and weeping, they first sacrifice to Adonis as if to a dead person, but then on the next day they proclaim that he lives and send him into the air. They also shave their heads, as do the Egyptians when Apis dies. The women who refuse to shave pay this penalty. 
For a singular day, they stand offering their beauty for sale. The market, however, is open to foreigners only, and the payment becomes an offering to Aphrodite. There are some inhabitants of Byblos who say that the Egyptian Osiris is buried among them, and that all the laments and the rites are performed not to Adonis, but to Osiris. I will also tell you on what grounds they consider this account to be reliable. Each year a head comes from Egypt to Byblos, making the voyage in seven days, and the winds carry it by divine guidance. It does not turn aside in any direction, but it comes only to Byblos. This is quite miraculous. It occurs every year. Indeed, it happened while I was present in Byblos, and I saw the Biblian head. There is also another marvel in the land of Byblos. A river from Mount Lebanon empties into the sea. Adonis is the name given to the river. Each year, the river becomes blood red, and having changed its colour, flows into the sea and reddens a large part of it giving a signal for lamentations to the inhabitants of Byblos. They tell the story that on these days Adonis is being wounded up on Mount Lebanon and his blood, as it goes into the water, alters the river and gives the stream its name. St Jerome was born around 345 AD and spent much of his life in the Levant. He notes that there was a grove to Adonis in Bethlehem where he was bewailed. He tells us, What we have rendered as Adonis... The Hebrew and Syrian languages denote as Tammuz. According to a pagan tale, Venus' lover, a very beautiful youth, is killed in the month of June. After this he is said to have risen and the month of June is named after him. There is an annual celebration of his feast in which women bewail him as dead and then he is praised in the song when he returns to life. Subsequently it is shown what leaders and elders of the house of Israel did in the temple, in the darkness and in the chambers. The sins of the women are also described. They complain about their loss of intercourse with their lovers and they rejoice if they can regain it. The same pagans interpret in a subtle manner the poet's narrative of a similar kind, narratives about shameful things. They understand the sequence of wailing and joy as referring to the death and resurrection of Adonis. They take his death to be shown by the seeds that die in the earth and his resurrection by the crops in which the dead seeds are reborn. So taking together the evidence from the rites of Adonis and his mythical biography, that's all there is of relevance to Jesus. Prior to these records, we have virtually no evidence pertaining to Adonis at all. There are some rather tenuous links that have been proposed to Armana letters of the mid-14th century BC and a tiny fragment of an inscription dated to the 10th century BC from near Byblos that refers to other gods that may be associated with Adonis and may imply that he was believed at that time to be alive and therefore to somehow have been raised from the dead. But this line of argument is highly speculative. The circumstantial evidence linking Adonis to the founding of Christianity is quite strong. Adonis originated in the Levant as a Canaanite religion, close to the geographical origin of Christianity. He originated many centuries earlier, but we have good evidence to believe that he was still being worshipped around the time and place of Jesus. Furthermore, Adonis is one of a small number of pagan gods mentioned in the Old Testament. Just how small that number is is open to dispute, as some instances appear to be different spellings of the same god. However, there seem to be about 35 of these. This makes it more difficult to argue that if any close similarities are found, they are purely coincidental, as we are looking at random coincidences occurring one time in tens, rather than one in hundreds or thousands. So what of the similarities? How close was Jesus to Adonis? We can all agree on one thing. Both of them died, and only a minority of figures worshipped in the ancient world died. It's a significant minority true, but it is still a minority. Were they both resurrected? This becomes more contentious. From earlier sources, the best we can do for resurrection is that Adonis was associated with the agrarian cycle of life and death, which is a concept in the right ballpark, but on the other hand it seems difficult to imagine that this concept was what led to the idea of Jesus coming back from the dead. And God-making was preoccupied with certain things, including birth, death and the afterlife. That being so, it seems credible that one in a few tens of gods would share such characteristics with Jesus. There are later unambiguous references to a rising Adonis, but these occur in the descriptions of rites mainly given to us by Christians, and at the very least at a point in antiquity when Christianity was ascendant. 
Therefore, these references may be explained by Christians interpreting the Adonis cult through Christianity-tinted spectacles, or by the Adonis cult adopting successful features from the popular Christian religion which they were competing with. Really, though, that's where the parallels with Jesus end. Other claimed similarities, such as him being a saviour figure, have no concrete evidence in the record. He did share an unusual birth with Jesus, but his birth was so different from that of Jesus, and this is such a general category that it's fairly useless. So weigh the evidence yourself. For my money, the circumstantial evidence is fairly good, but it's not good enough to overcome the paucity of similarity evidence, leading me to prefer the consensus position that, whether real or imagined, Jesus initially developed from Judaism and only acquired pagan trappings centuries later. I find it unlikely that the Adonis story significantly influenced his initial development.